here on this, uh, another one of those jury Sundays. I feel like we get those a lot anymore um, on this week of spring break for many of our people. Glad that you have chosen to be with us this morning. Um, if you're new, just let me say that we feel like this is a good place for you. Uh, but if you have your Bibles with you today, go ahead and grab those. Be turning with me to the book of 2 Timothy. Um, so if you're not sure exactly where that's at, it's towards the back of your Bible. And if this is your first time with us, just let me say you are not too far behind. This is just our second week in a series that we're just calling, Why Are We Here? Um, and so what we mean by that is not necessarily, why are you here with us this morning? Um, I think for most of us, we probably know um, it's, it's the free coffee and child care, right? That's why most of us are here. Um, but this question we're asking this morning is a little more in-depth as we think about what are we really doing here with our lives? Uh, and like we talked about last week, I think this is an important question for us. Um, it's a question that a lot of people have that maybe a lot of people don't want to discuss. So I feel like this is one of the reasons that many people are so addicted to their phones. Um, so what's easier to think about, like, what's the point of my existence or to watch TikTok videos, right? So like to deal with some of these questions or to watch people who can't dance, try to dance, or to watch people fall on their faces. I think we know it's much easier to kind of numb our brains and our minds from wrestling with this question. But look, this morning, church, at the end of the day, this is something that at some point every person wrestles with internally. This question of, is there something more than this? So is there something more to doing what we always do than getting up and going to work working X amount of hours this week just to come home and run here and try to get this done and that done to go to bed exhausted just to get up the next day and do it all over again. Does anybody relate to that? Sometimes that's how we feel, right? Like this is how life works for many of us. But I think even scripturally, we see kind of this idea that this question is in our hearts. So Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that God has put eternity into our hearts. And that means that we possess an innate knowledge. So we recognize deep down in our soul, there is something more to life than what we see and experience in the here and now. And so last week, where we kicked this thing off, we said that we are here ultimately because there is a God who exists who has put us here. So we said last week, there is a God who's created all of the world and all of humanity. And we didn't even necessarily use the Bible to prove the fact that there is a God who exists. So really, last week was more of using logic, of using common sense. So we talked about this idea that there is general revelation that there is a God. And that really can't be denied. So that's what Romans 1 tells us, that people, so all of humanity across this globe, they are without excuse. So they know there is a powerful, intelligent God out there through what he's made. But for us, where we come to this morning, we're moving past what God has made to now what God has said. So the question of why are we here? So how can we know what life is really supposed to be about? Is there a point to all of this? Starts with knowing there is a God who has uniquely created you and me in his image. So I think that's a good launch point. But at the same time, that's not enough to give us the whole picture. So just knowing there is a God is not enough to answer that question, why are we here fully? And that's really what we're after this morning. That we can know why we're here not only because there is a God who exists, but also we can know why we're here because the Bible is true. Because God not only has created humanity, he also has spoken to humanity. And I know I had you... Turn to 2 Timothy, and we'll get there in just a moment. But if you want to, for just a second, flip back in your Bibles to Psalms. Uh, so look at Psalm 19 for just a moment. It'll be there on the screen. And I want to show you the progression of the witness that creation gives being helped by the witness that Scripture actually gives. So I want us to see how both of these things, so evidence of creation and the trustworthiness of the Bible, these things work together, they coincide to give our lives meaning, to give our lives purpose. So if you look at Psalm 19, verse 1, the Bible says this, The heavens 
declare the glory of God. And the expanse proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day, so all the time, constantly, they are pouring out speech. Not after not, they're communicating knowledge. Again, there is a God. And again, this is what basically we covered last week. That all creation screams, there is someone greater that has created all that we see and even what we don't see. Like the amazement of the sky and the stars. The beauty of a sunset has a way of making us go, this is unbelievable. Like this has to prove there's an intelligent, creative, powerful something or someone behind all of this. But I think at the same time, there's only so much that stars or a sunset can actually say. So it's kind of like, think about it like a painting. Now, a painting may be beautiful, right? And sometimes when it comes to art, art can be a little bit subjective, can it? Like, have you ever seen something that's called a masterpiece, and you're thinking, like, what in the world is this? It looks like a toddler has done it. So take, for example, this picture right here. How much money would you be willing to pay for this portrait, this painting? If you're like me, like, I'm paying somebody not to make me take it and throw it away, right? Look, church, this painting right here, a few years ago, sold for $300 million. Life's crazy, isn't it? That's why I tell my kids every time they draw something, like, all right, let's keep it. Let's post it to Facebook Marketplace. Let's try to sell this thing. Maybe we'll get rich off of it. But look, even if you're blown away by painting, what it tells us about the artist is very limited. So you can't look at this picture and know much about what the artist is like. No, you'd have to actually talk to them to know what they're like, wouldn't you? You'd have to, at the very least, read their autobiography to know, okay, this is who this person is. And look, church, in this really kind of oversimplified way, this is what the Bible is. This is God's autobiography. So this is the way we get to know him. This is how we learn what God is like. Because although creation tells us some things about God, it does not tell us enough. It doesn't tell us all there is to know. Like nature supplies us with enough information to know there is a God. But if we are going to know this God and be saved through his son, we need to know more than creation itself can teach us on its own. So we could say like this, the world isn't enough. We also need the word. We also need the Bible. Because what the Bible does, it tells us a couple things. It tells us firstly what we need to know about our creator. But it also tells us what we need to know in order to live our lives pleasing to him. And that's what the Bible gives us. So it gives us what we need if we want to experience the highest, the deepest, the widest, most satisfying joy in life. Does anybody want that this morning? Does anybody want to experience like the highest and deepest and widest and most satisfying joy in life? We do, don't we? Like this is what we're ultimately after. But the Bible teaches us if you want that, it's found through knowing God and living for him. And that's why in the next few verses of this psalm, the writer shifts. So there is this transition from what the world teaches us about God to what this word teaches us about God. To how this word actually works in our hearts. So drop down in Psalm 19 to verse 7. The instruction, so this is speaking about this word here. The instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord, the right, making the heart glad. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than an abundance of pure gold, and sweeter than honey. And look, I don't know about for you, but to me, this makes it seem like the word is pretty important, does it not? Like if this word is sweeter than honey, or maybe to make it more relatable for us, sweeter than what? Chocolate cake? Sweeter than fudge brownies? Sweeter than bacon-wrapped Oreos? I don't know if you've had those. We've had them here at church. Praise God for that. 
But it's saying like this word is sweeter than all of those things. And if this word makes our hearts glad, if it brings light to our eyes, if it renews our life, I think we might want to pay attention to it. So we might want to start using this book to help us answer the question, why are we here? Like, what's the point of all this? And that's really our main point this morning, that the Bible is completely reliable, which means this important truth. We don't have to worry about what will happen. But the Bible is also totally relevant, which means we don't have to wonder about what we should be doing. And so with that, let's pray. Let's ask for the Spirit to move, and we'll jump into our text this morning. Father, we come to you through our risen Savior, Christ thanking you that we can approach you with boldness and confidence, that we can come to you and we can find mercy and help in our time of need. And guys, we approach your word, help us not to approach it lightly, help us to think about what it truly is, that it's sweet, it renews us, it restores us. It's through this that we learn about the sweet saving grace of you. God, we pray that you be with us, let your spirit move and work in our lives. Help us, God, to learn and apply it to our lives. We pray and ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So now, 2 Timothy. As we come to 2 Timothy, we're just going to read a few verses. So this is not our typical, like, in-depth deal where we, you know, do a deep dive into these things. But here's what you need to know. So you've got this letter written from Paul to his dearly loved son in the faith, Timothy. Paul's writing this letter from a prison cell. And he's writing again to Timothy, who is a pastor at the church at Ephesus. And look, the church at Ephesus was a messed up place. So this was a place that had a lot of spiritual confusion. It was a church that had a lot of new Christians who knew next to nothing about this book. Who knew next to nothing about the Bible. So what Paul does here, particularly at the point where we jump in in his letter, he reminds this young pastor about what the Bible is, what it does, and how it does it. So he's basically saying, listen, Timothy, they don't know how important this book is, but you do. And I don't want you to forget it, and I want you to help them learn it. So let's read 2 Timothy, starting at verse 14 of chapter 3. And God's word says, but as for you, Timothy, continue in what you've learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you, and you know that from infancy, you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. In verse 16 and 17, all scripture is breathed out or inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So Paul here has just laid out a couple of really important truths when it comes to the Bible. First of all, he tells us here that it's through these sacred scriptures, it's through these words that we gain wisdom. We gain understanding that salvation comes through faith in Christ. So look, here's what the Bible teaches essentially from beginning to the very end. That mankind is rebellious. Did you know that? Did you know that you're rebellious? That mankind is sinful, that actually we are pretty ignorant people at times. So somebody look to the person sitting around you and say, you're pretty ignorant. Don't be shy about doing it. It's okay. They need to know the truth of what the Bible teaches. Look, ever since God created us, he created us to worship him and live for him. But even ever since that moment, we have decided that we're not on board for that. That instead of living for him, we'd rather do what, church? We'd rather live for ourselves. And what this living by our own standard, living for ourselves has done, it's caused this divide. So it's created this relational fracture in how we now as humanity relate to God. So God is perfectly holy and can have nothing to do with anything sinful, which again is what we all are. So then how do we know what it takes for our sin to be covered? How do we understand what it means for us to be forgiven? How do we know, honestly, if it's even a possibility for us to be brought back into right relationship with God? 
for that relational fracture to be repaired. You see, I think worldly wisdom would say, okay, this is what you do. Okay, if you've messed up, if you need to fix that, what do you do? So if you've done something bad, then what does common sense tell you to make up for it? Do something good, right? Okay, you've done this amount of bad, so do this amount of good, and all things will work out. I think this is the mindset we have in most of our relationships. Like when I do something wrong to Lauren. For example, this week when I leave her for three days to go to the basketball state tournament and leave her alone with three kids. I know that's not a great thing. I know I'm going to do something or need to do something to try to fix that. So what am I going to try to do? I'm going to try when I get back home, say, honey, look, I'm going to watch the kids for 45 minutes. That way we can be even. (laughs) That I left you for three days. But look, in the same way, that's not going to work. That's not going to work, is it? Just to be sure, I want to ask to be clear. <laughs> Look, in the same way, that's not going to work. The actions we do or don't do, in an attempt to make up for what we did or didn't do, they're not going to work either. No salvation to fix this broken relationship comes, listen to me, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And how do we know that? Where do we gain this wisdom, this important wisdom from this word? Ephesians 1, 7 says, in him, speaking of the risen Christ, of Jesus, we have redemption. We have salvation through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according not to what we've done, according to the riches of his grace. So look, it's here that we learn that salvation from our sin is a work of God. It's not the work of us. That it's based on grace. It's not based on the grind. Now look, this isn't saying that mere Bible knowledge saves, is it? So there are tons of people who know the Bible extremely well. Who can kill it at Bible trivia. And yet they are not wise for salvation. Understand the Bible was not given for information. No, it was given for transformation, wasn't it? And look, there's no wisdom more important than this wisdom in the world. So you can be wise about all kinds of stuff. And some of you are very wise. Some of you are wise when it comes to business. Some of you are wise and savvy when it comes to the medical world. Now, when it comes to medical, I don't know anything. Some of you are wise when it comes to technology. Some of y'all can build anything. Some of y'all can fix anything. And praise God for those good gifts. Look, that means nothing if you are not wise for salvation. If you don't really understand the implications of the bloody cross, of the empty tomb, and what it means for your eternity. So one thing that Paul reminds Timothy is that this book lets us know clearly that salvation so recompense for sin is only possible through a perfect blood sacrifice, which is found only in the perfect sacrifice of Christ. And look, this is why we should be so intentional, so proactive in getting the name of Jesus to the nations. That's why we're commanded to take this gospel, speaking of Christ, to those who are far off so they can receive salvation, understand what it means. But Paul also tells them something else. He also lets them know that it's through the Bible that not only are we saved through Christ, but that we actually grow in Christ. That's what verses 16 and 17 that we read tells us. That all Scripture. And look, you know what that word all means in the Greek? It means all. It means every single bit of it. It means Old Testament. It means New Testament. is useful for us if we actually want to mature and grow in our faith. So to John Stott, who said, Christians who neglect the Bible simply do not mature. And that's why typically we preach straight through books of the Bible. So we don't want to pick and choose. Like, hey, this sounds good. This might work. No, we know it all works. Even those parts we don't want to work sometimes. This is what the Scripture is teaching us. That all scripture grows us, it equips us, it trains us. So we can kind of summarize what Paul is saying like this. The Bible is what gives us what we need for salvation in Christ. 
But the Bible is also what gives us what we need to grow to be more like Christ. Look, here's where the issue arises for a lot of people when it comes to this book. So here's what a lot of people will say. But how can we know this book is true? So how can we know this information here is actually accurate and not just some made-up fairy tale trying to push some certain agenda? And I believe that's a pretty fair question. Look, if this book isn't true... So if what we have before us is nothing good or nothing more than a good fictional book with some good fictional stories, that changes everything in a hurry, doesn't it? Like who's going to base your life and your eternity off of a book that may or may not be true? It doesn't seem very wise. I mean, in school, I love reading the book Lord of the Flies. Anybody ever read that book? It's a good book, but I don't want to base my life off of it. I don't think it's wise to think, okay, I probably need to put somebody's head on a stick. Like, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Look, this is what we're seeing. But let me ask you this, just for you to think about for a second. If someone were to ask you, how do you know what's in here is true? What would be your response? Somebody comes up to you and say, hey, okay, I know you're a believer, you're a Christian, but how do you know the Bible's true? Maybe you would say, I, I don't really know. So maybe you're here and you're skeptical. That's okay. Again, we're glad you're here. But I think the most of us, our response would be, well, the Bible is true because Bible, right? Well, it's true because it's the Bible. But is that not kind of a circular argument? Like it doesn't really get you anywhere, does it? It's like saying, hey, how do you know you're right? Because I'm right. Well, how do you know I'm right? Because I'm right. But look, that's not that helpful. There needs to be some proof. And fortunately for us, we have some proof that this word is true. And that's just what I want to show you this morning simply. Some reasons why we can trust the Bible is true. Number one, why can we trust the Bible is true? Because as you see there, because it's entirely consistent. So let's just imagine for a moment that we take every person in this room and we have every single one of us write down a story. And look, when it comes to this story, we don't give any advice. We don't give any direction. No, we just say, hey, write down whatever you feel like writing. Now, what are the odds? Think about it. If we were to take all of these stories that we have written, and we put them all into one book, that that story is going to make any sense at all. Do we think there's really any chance, any probability of that happening? Not really, right? Because some of you, you're going to write about what? Some of you are going to write about how much you love your pets. That's great. Some of you are going to write about how corrupt the government is. I'm not going to say that's great, but maybe it's true. Some of you are going to write about how much you love sports. This morning, we might write about how losing an hour of sleep should be illegal, right? That's how a lot of us are feeling right now in this moment. But we know that message is not going to be consistent. It's not going to fit together. But now think about this. This book is a collection of 66 different books written over, hear this, written over 1,500 years by over 40 different authors, 40 different men, and three different languages. And these books are all a mixed bag. You've got different styles, different genres, written by people with all kinds of different backgrounds. But despite all that, when you read it, here's what's undeniable. All of these books are working together to tell the same story. Like the Bible has one single theme running all the way through it. Telling the unified, coherent story of humanity's creation by God, our rebellion against God, and God's redemption, His plan for redemption of His people. So it's kind of like flipping through 66 different TV channels. And although they might not have the same actors, they might not have the same setting, they all have the same plot. In different ways, they're all saying that God saves sinners through Christ. Every single part of this book is pointing to that truth. God saves sinners through Jesus. Look, how is that possible? That over all those years, with all these different writers, it's all telling the same message. 
Because we know, hopefully, that although man penned it, he wrote it, God was actually behind it. Every single word in this book, Paul told us, is breathed out by God. Look, this is possible because the Holy Spirit, so the third person in the Trinity, who is God, told these men what to write. So if you look at 2 Peter, here's what we see. Above all, so that seems important. Peter says, above all, know this, no prophecy of Scripture comes from the prophet's own interpretation. Because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so it's through the work of the Holy Spirit that we don't have a collection of made-up nonsense that doesn't really make sense. But a story beginning in Genesis, working its way all the way through to Revelation, pointing to a Savior who would redeem creation and one day make all things new. So look, it's a good story, but it's also a true story. Because secondly, we can trust the Bible is true because it's historically accurate. And look, there's a lot. There's so much we could talk about here. But to spare you a full-on history lesson, time and time again, the Bible has proven historically, geographically, and archaeologically accurate. So you think about some of these cities we read about in the New Testament. Those cities are actual cities. You think about some of the things that happened in the Old Testament. You think about Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel. There's been evidence that tower was being built. You think about the flood. There's evidence there was a worldwide flood. You even think about those crazy plagues that God brought upon the Egyptians to rescue his people out of bondage. There are evidence, or there's evidence that those plagues actually took place. Now look, we could keep going and going. But here's what one non-Christian archaeologist said. It may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever once contradicted and biblical reverence, reference. And look, it's not like people are not trying to disprove historical events of the Bible. No, they are trying, but they can't. Why, church? Because the Bible's true. That's what we see. And not only is it true because it's historically accurate, we can trust it also because it has eyewitness accounts. And now I agree with some people who would say, yeah, but sometimes, Jesse, we understand, like, eyewitnesses can make things up they can be faulty so do you ever had a conversation with somebody you knew they were making something up like we know those people who you can only believe about eight percent of what they say right like the rest is some kind of exaggeration like they're just blowing smoke but the truth is you're not going to blow smoke you're not going to make something up that might get you killed are you are you going to make something up that makes life worse though that's not how we operate that's not what we do and just think about what happened to Paul, for what he said, for what he wrote about Jesus. So 2 Corinthians 11 says, Five times I received the 40 lashes minus one from the Jews. That sounds rough, doesn't it? Three times I was beaten with rods. Anybody going to make up something that gets you beaten with rods? Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked. On frequent journeys. I face dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers among false brothers. A lot of dangers. Verse 27, toil and hardship, many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst. Look, I'm not going to make up anything that I can't eat. That's what Paul does. I was hungry. I was thirsty. Often without food, cold, without clothing. Honestly. Take away any notions you might have. Does this sound like a reason to make up what he wrote about the Jesus of the Bible? I don't believe so. Look, this is what happened. These eyewitnesses, these apostles were often persecuted or martyred for what they said. Pascal once put it like this. I only believe those witnesses who get their throats cut. This is what happened to Jesus' followers, to many of them. But why else can we trust the Bible is true? Because fourthly, as you see there, because the Bible, it says the same thing it's always said. So here's a question. How can we be sure that over time man hasn't changed the words in this book to say what we want it to say? How can we be sure that like we've not transitioned this thing to make it change with the times? 
Because that happens sometimes, doesn't it? So we may have written something in our past that we have went back on later and completely changed. So maybe a contract that something happened. Okay, we had written this, but now we've got to restructure this. Maybe for you, a love letter that you've written in the past that you really needed to go back and rephrase, right? So maybe at one point you wrote a love letter and said, to my dearly beloved, I promise to do always whatever it takes to make you happy. And then you've been married for 20 years, like, to my beloved, I promise to leave you alone if you leave me alone, right? Like sometimes things change like that. That's why they make white outs. Look, how can we know the Bible has not used any white outs? Like, how can we be sure that what they put in the canon still says today the same thing? It said in some cases 3,000 years ago. Well, for one, we have over 5,800 original Greek manuscripts to study and compare it with. And I know when you hear 5,800, that might not sound like a lot. But when compared with other ancient books, this is a ton. And when it comes to these 5,800 original manuscripts, none have resulted in any real discrepancies. None have showed any changes through the ages. And even more recently, in around the 1950s, there was the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in Qumran, Israel. And so what they found in this cave was some old Testament manuscripts in these clay pots. And look, these are by far the oldest manuscripts that we have. And incredibly, when they were compared with the more recent manuscripts, so the more recent renderings of the Bible, no real differences were found. They were basically identical. Look, what does that tell us? It tells us we can have confidence that what we have in our Bibles today is an accurate translation of the very Word of God. That this word has been preserved, it's been protected by his sovereign rule throughout history. I mean, think about it like this. If God can create the world with all its wonder, don't you think he can surely preserve his word with complete accuracy and inerrancy? I believe he can. That's why I trust the Bible's true, but I also trust it's true. Because we see fifthly here, none of the promises made in the Bible have failed. Listen, the Bible contains hundreds of prophecies. Hundreds of these promises of things that would happen, including 300 or over 300 specific prophecies in the Old Testament, of which every single one of them are fulfilled in detail through the death, the life, and resurrection of Jesus. And we could spend a long time talking about this, but the odds of that happening, of just these little over 300 prophecies coming to fulfillment, are less than 10 to the 17th power. Now in our heads, we probably can't do that math, can we? But that is less than 1 in 2,000 zeros. So look, all these things being told would happen, then happening is not really possible by chance. No, Numbers 23, 19 tells us, does he speak and not act? Or promise and not fulfill? He promises and he fulfills, church. We can trust it's true, because none of the promises have failed. But then another thing, the last thing I'll point out to you this morning, we can trust the Bible is true because it's still changing lives even today. So here's what's amazing. Throughout history, in every time and in every place, this book has gone out. It has supernaturally, through the Spirit, worked to change lives. So in every century, this book has proved itself to be able to transform people. To take those who are far from God and make them into sons and daughters. To take those who are eaten up with sin and make them whole through the blood of Christ. So perhaps you remember the great philosopher, Winnie the Pooh. Y'all remember the great philosopher, Winnie the Pooh? But he was kind of faced with a similar situation to how a lot of people approach the Bible. So Pooh finds himself staring at a jar and wondering if he can be sure of what's inside. Now this jar had the word honey written on it. When he took off the top of the jar, it looked like honey. It smelled like honey. But Pooh said, but you just never can tell. And look, this is how a lot of people are with this book. The facts are there, but people still will not believe them. 
And why is that? Because 2 Corinthians 4 tells us the God of this age has them blinded. Look, the truth is, unless the Spirit enlightens them, they may never believe this book is true. But if you want to know for yourself if this book is true, you have to do what Pooh did. You've got to taste and see for yourself. It's like Tozer put it. The big problem really is not whether the Bible is true. The big problem is whether it's true in you. And look, when you start to study this book and the Spirit starts to open up your eyes, what you start to realize is that just like all the promises of God haven't failed yet, they will not fail in the future either. And that's why I would say just as difficult and challenging as life is for some of you even now, for those in Christ, we can trust the Bible's true and we can take to heart some of his encouraging words to us. That we can consider that the sufferings this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed. Church, do you believe that? That's what the Bible says. Do you believe, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4.16, that life is hard? The Bible says even beyond this in 2 Timothy 3.12, before we read, for all those in Christ, persecutions will come, but we do not give up even though our outer person is being destroyed. And sometimes we feel that. It feels like, man, our outer person, everything is working against us. Our inner person is being renewed day by day for our momentary light affliction. And there'd be some who say, my affliction is not light. It's heavy. It's hard. It's challenging. It stinks. But it's producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. Look, like I said, the Bible can be trusted, so this should give us hope for tomorrow. Because in the end, what does the Bible really teach us? It teaches us that Jesus wins. Look, how do we know that? Because even a brutal death for the Savior dying in your place couldn't hold him down. And so if the Bible assures us of victory over our greatest enemy forever of sin, then why worry about what might happen to us tomorrow. But again, these words being true doesn't just impact our worry over tomorrow. It also impacts what we should be doing even today. Look, going back to the question, why are we here? Because God has put us here to live for Him. Like if the Bible is true, what does that mean for us? If the Bible is true, that means we should do what the Bible says. We should do what His words tell us. You look in Matthew 7, the conclusion to the Sermon on the Mount. Here's what Jesus says. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, who does them, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house. But did it fall, church? No, it didn't fall. Yet it didn't collapse. But why didn't it collapse? Because its foundation was on the rock. But then you compare that in verse 26. And maybe this is where some of us are at. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Look, if you want to make the most of your time here on this earth, you want to make sure that you don't go splat in the end if you want to actually experience, again, the highest, the deepest, the widest, most satisfying joy in life, it's pretty simple. Know God and live for Him. This is why you're here. This is why we study this book. Because all this book is profitable. These words, they do, if you meditate upon them, they make our hearts glad, even in difficult times. These words renew our life. You see, the Bible is true, so we can trust it. But the Bible's true, so we better do what it says. And so as we close this morning, I just want to ask you a simple question. I guess two simple questions. Do you trust it? Do you? I think the majority of us, probably maybe even all of us, would say, yeah, I trust it. But then are you doing what it says? And look, this is not for us to serve out of duty and feel obligated, oh no, oh no. Like we want to serve and do what it says out of delight. Why? Because we were sinners destined for eternal hell. 
But God, through his grace, sent Jesus to say, I'll take on the punishment you deserve. We want to do what it says because this is the best life for us. Living for him. So this morning, if you're not doing this, would you look to the cross? Would you ask for forgiveness even now? Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word.